Order members, the Assembly is resumed. It's time now for questions to the Minister for Finance. And I call Rachel Woods. Question number one. The, my officials are continuing to engage with the Department's Building Regulations Advisory Committee and the Specialist Technical Subcommittee to bring forward an uplift in this area as quickly as possible. There are a number of detailed and interconnected considerations on issues such as the assessment of software, outworkings of the proposals emerging from other regions, renewables and local grid consequences which are being considered alongside cost, benefit, assessment of options. My officials briefed the Finance Committee on some of the detail last week and have been invited to provide a similar briefing to the next meeting of the All-Party Group on Climate Change. Every effort is and will be made to progress and uplift in this Assembly mandate, if possible, and I will provide notice of any consultations in due course. I have also provided the Finance Committee with an outline of proposals for an ambitious phased plan of uplifts over the longer term, which the Department for the Economy has recently published in the Energy Strategy Options Consultation, and upon which we will consult in due course. I call Rachel Woods for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister will be aware that the carbon footprint of construction is unregulated but can account to up to 70% of a building's emissions over its lifetime. So can I ask the Minister if he intends to regulate embodied carbon in construction and if he will commit to meeting with me and members of Architects Climate Action Network Northern Ireland on the decarbonisation the, in the construction industry? Well, as I said, we, the, the Department is, and its uh, built regulations group are currently consulting with people in relation to doing significant uplifts in relation to that and addressing all of the issues because they, we have to fit in with the executive's overall carbon reduction uh, targets uh, over so it's not just in the short term and we have some catch up to do in the short term but in the long to medium term so I'm, I'm more than happy I know that the the people responsible were going to uh, brief your own committee uh, in relation uh, to uh, what has been undertaken but uh, we are uh, uh, more than happy to consult with others who have an interest in this and uh, if she contacts the department I'd be happy to meet her group. I call Melissa McHugh. At last, Carla. Uh, Minister, um, if we're to become a zero carbon society, uh, we need to improve uh, existing buildings as well as new structures. Uh, and is there any uh, work ongoing to retrofit uh, existing buildings at present? Well, uh, the building regulations set standards only when building work takes place, uh, and grant schemes and programmes to encourage retrofit are principally a matter for other departments to lead. And I know the Energy Strategy Cross Departmental Group is looking at this. Our, our built and regulation standards for, is for work to existing buildings are largely in line with England's and we consider the standards in place in the south and any proposed uplifts in other regions uh, to come into effect during 2022 as part of our programme. Uh, but we will also look at the, the issue of retrofits within that uh, and we are mindful of the uh, aims for zero emissions built in stock by 2050 and new building should not contribute to the need for further retrofit. Uh, so that means you have to get the regulations right as they are now uh, and try and, and resolve uh, issues with buildings. Uh, so the uplift we're, we're looking at is currently considering significant improvements to the limiting fabric standards for new buildings and even further improvement is anticipated in the subsequent uplifts thereafter with this in mind. Uh, substan sudden and extreme uplifts from performance standards could halt industry altogether and that's why a phased solution to this uh, towards a very high standard is proposed. I call Patsy McGlone. Very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I can wait. Vishenaira asked now, Fragiri Ganigishaw. Could the Minister advise just what action his department has taken to improve the existing energy efficiency of public buildings? And does he plan to review uh, the department's energy management and public sector buildings manual, which hasn't apparently been updated since 2015? Well, the, the, my department is responsible for managing the civil service office of the state, which equates to around 4% of the total public sector energy consumption here. Uh, we aim through the office of state energy efficiency carbon reduction plans to achieve cumulative energy savings and consequential reductions in carbon. These savings support and feed into the wider energy management strategy and action plan to 2030 for central government introduced by the Department for the Economy. Use of energy efficient installations has been incorporated into civil service accommodation and standard specification and further our procurement guidance which applies to all departments expects that any new or refurbished buildings should undergo BRE environmental assessment method appraisal. And this seeks uh, energy performance standards significantly in excess of the building regulations minimum. Moving on, I call Joanne Bunting. Uh, question two, please. 
With your permission, Las Concord, I wish to group questions 2 and question 11. Uh, I want to place on my record my continued thanks to civil servants for their hard work and flexibility in response to the challenges of delivering services during the pandemic. It was with very short notice this time last year the majority of civil servants moved from office to home, working as the pandemic uh, emerged. I am encouraged by feedback from my own department on the positive impact that home working is having for many of our staff who feel they now have a better balance between work and home commitments. In relation to the matter of productivity, the responsibility for performance and productivity of all staff, including staff who work from home, rests with managers in each of the departments. Staff in the Department of Finance have continued to deliver essential services while also delivering unprecedented support of COVID funding to thousands of businesses, including rates relief, range of business grants and support for airports and hospices. The civil service will be adopting a blended approach to home remote working depending on the individual departmental requirements and job role. A remote working and home working policy has currently been developed in consultation with trade unions. The department have also recently announced plans for a number of civil service regional hubs, which will enable civil servants to work closer to home reduce travel time and promote regional economic balance. I call Joan Dunning. Mr Deputy Speaker, and just with your indulgence, while I'm on my feet, I would like to take this opportunity to condemn the attack on the police officer. I think it's important that as a member of the policing board that I do that um, and send our best wishes to her and her family. Um, it's very clear, Mr Deputy Speaker, that working from home really can't continue ad infinitum. So given the need to open the economy, to instill confidence in the community um, and the extent of the rollout of the vaccine, shouldn't the civil service lead by example and have those who do not fall into a vulnerable category return to the workplace as quickly as possible? Well, firstly, there'd be, uh, any return to the workplace will be guided by the health advice, uh, which the executive will agree as a whole, uh, and as uh, still the advice uh, from, the, from the health department and from our health advisor and executive is to work from home where possible. Uh, so that continues to be the place. Undoubtedly, the whole experience of the pandemic has accelerated a trend that was already developing in terms of how people work. Uh, and we have to be mindful of that, that uh, you know, civil servants have uh, the, the uh, ability now to work from, uh, as we will now say, in a blended situation where they can either be at home uh, in a more regional location or in headquarters. Uh, and it won't uh, significantly affect uh, the, the civil service footprint in Belfast, for instance, there still will be a requirement for a large number of civil servants working out of offices here, but it does change the office accommodation requirements. And we have a responsibility to look at that not only in terms of the benefits of individual civil servants and workers, but also in the requirements that the executive has to spend on civil service estate. If the nature of work is changing, if uh, technology can allow us to work more remotely, then we have a duty in terms of the public services that we want to support uh, to try and ensure that we are not spending money on civil service estate that we don't require. So it is a balance between all of those things. Uh, I have no doubt people will be going back to work in the not too distant future, but we have to ensure, firstly, that it's in, in line with the health advice, and secondly, that the new way that we've developed to work in is something which will ultimately be of benefit uh, to public finances and to individual workers as well. I call Claire Sugden. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Um, I also put my record uh, on record condemnation of the, the attack within my constituency. Um, I actually see opportunities in working from home moving uh, forward. Um, I also recognise there might need to be a hybrid model. Um, but what um, savings could we identify and uh, the, the, the positive benefits for, for family life and, and for getting women back into the workplace does the Minister see as a lesson moving forward? Well, it's very hard uh, to quantify savings, and, and if you put out a figure there, that becomes the target. And the, this is much more than that, as you've identified. Uh, it is about that uh, responsibility uh, people have to home, to caring situations, and that uh, you know, the, perhaps even in the longer term, the willingness of people to apply for jobs, which are Belfast-based, and, and they have to involve themselves travelling an hour or two hours a day in a car, maybe even more than that, if they're coming from further west. Uh, to come in to do work five days a week in a department headquarters. So I have no doubt that this will change the nature of work. Uh, it will actually open it up more to women and to people who, who uh, unfortunately, the primary caring function falls upon, uh, to people who are living further uh, in the regions uh, of this part of Ireland than, than perhaps those that are, are, are living in, in the urban centres. Uh, and so I think it will open up a lot of opportunities. It will undoubtedly allow us to rationalise the civil services state more, and that should yield savings. But that's not 
the primary drive behind all of this. I think we want to have a more effective and more productive uh, working environment for people. Uh, and I think certainly the regional hubs uh, are something which will allow not only that to take place and contribute more to local economies in the, in the regional centres, but also to allow an exchange between, if you like, local government and, and central government personnel to create more space for that uh, joined up and connected government. So I, I think there are real benefits to come from this. I loathe to put any figures on it. Uh, I think undoubtedly it will yield some savings, but I think the, the major importance in relation to this is how people themselves as individuals work and how uh, more people, uh, more ver a variety of people, uh, particularly women and those who are under, unrepresented, are underrepresented in the civil service, can actually access uh, potential opportunities there. I call Robbie Butler. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his answers. Um, Minister, what analysis has your department made from levels of sickness related to stress in particular and whether home or remote working has indeed improved productivity? Well, we have done uh, a, a kind of analysis, our survey of our own uh, members within the Department of Finance and there's an overwhelmingly positive response to the home working uh, situation. Uh, uh, it, uh, almost across the entire workforce within the Department of Finance. Uh, and so I'm sure that that's not unique. I'm sure it's reflected generally across the civil service. And people have uh, then, I think, you know, with all of the challenges the pandemic and lockdown has brought to us, people have recognised that, that kind of blended working, where some of it can be working from home, some of it perhaps can be in some of these regional hubs that we're going to develop, some of it is in headquarters uh, and coming in to, to the city centres or the, the town centres uh, to do work, that that actually affords people more a scope within their own lives to manage all of the responsibilities they have within their lives. So it has been very, very positive. It's been very positively received. Uh, I think it, it accelerates lessons that were already beginning to be learned uh, and will probably accelerate a response to that in terms of workforce planning from here on in. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, and Minister, you've just mentioned about the, the hubs. Can I ask how many um, you expect the Connect2 hubs will be able to hold? Well, it, that, that will depend on, on the, the ones, you know, they're all different uh, setups. You're probably more familiar with the one in Downpatrick, which is one of the early ones that, that we intend to do. Some of them are in development phase, and uh, in some uh, council areas we're talking to councils about future development and how. Uh, so the, the initial 10 that were in the, in the rollout uh, are either almost ready to go or are expected to be ready within, I think it's two years. Uh, um, I, I think the... Uh, Response to them again has been overwhelmingly positive because not only does it allow people to work closer to home and save that uh, travel time, the carbon emissions, but also allow people to contribute to their own local economy and then also to manage their work life balance better because they're not spending more time in cars. Uh, but also, I think that the, the uh, the, the sense that that, I think, can assist and in, uh, improve in productivity is, is one that we will be looking forward to. And I expect uh, that when we do get these 10 in place that we will be looking at, at ones in the future. But each one is different. Uh, it probably will have different accommodation requirements. But these are based on studies of where people were traveling in to uh, Belfast from. Uh, and, and that kind of uh, focused the attention on where they were needed in the first run. Uh, and so what we, the, it's not fixed desks for people. So it's not an alternative place to work, but it is somewhere where people can work for a number of days a week. And I call Matthew Till. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I agree with the Minister on the value of, of flexible working. I, mean, I don't agree with the, previous, the original questioner that you know, somehow that, that is something that should be, we should be suspicious of. But what I want to know from the Minister is, is that going to be tied into the broader and more urgent uh, look at the structural flaws in our civil service? We know that 80 per cent, for example, of our senior civil servants are over 50. We know that we have high levels of vacancy rates. How is this going to be linked to the workforce strategy to give us the civil service we need in the years to come? Because frankly, Minister, and I'm sure you won't disagree, we have major serious structural flaws in our civil service at the minute. It's way, way beyond working from home, but the Minister may wish to comment on it. Well, it is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very broad issue. I suppose we could spend a long time uh, talking about it. But I have to say, th these things all are interrelated. They complement each other. When I say in the longer term, the, the ability to work, not just to have to travel a couple of hours a day and to work, will allow more people, a more uh, varied people, perhaps people who are underrepresented in the civil service currently, to apply for jobs. And we are looking very closely at all of the issues that he has uh, mentioned. There is a real need. There have been a number of reports, the RHI, the Audit Office report, uh, all have looked at the, the, the makeup and capacity of the civil service. And there is significant work to be done there, and we intend to bring that forward. I think these developments I think will assist in that because I think it opens up more opportunities for a broader scope of people to become employed in the civil service. Moving on, I call Philip McGuigan. 
Okay, ever a tree? Question number three. I firstly want to commend all the eight councils and the two universities along the corridor for coming together to produce this landmark report, which showed significant opportunities to be gained from working together in this way. It is important that the corridor drives balanced economic growth across the island. For example, high-speed uh, Belfast to Dublin train should be part of an all-Ireland rail network that includes Derry, Cork and Limerick. I understand the Council's next steps will be to establish an oversight and governance board who will develop a programme of works. This is what is needed now alongside an action plan so that the corridor can form part of an investment-led recovery from COVID and Brexit. My department is, of course, content to play its part as the Council seek their economic development work uh, of the corridor forward. I call Philip McQueen for supplement. Gura Melgood, uh, and, and thank the Minister for his answer. And I look forward to the outworkings of the report and the, and the positive benefits being produced for the citizens and businesses who live along the corridor. Can I ask the Minister, just he mentioned the Belfast uh, to Dublin train, you know, as part of this work and as part of an all air rail network, can he maybe provide some of the benefits that would be produced from a high speed train from Belfast to Dublin? Well, I think it's long been recognised. I mean, uh, back in the day when I was a minister with responsibility for transport, it was recognised, particularly at north-south engagements, that the, the ambition uh, for a, 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 a more high-speed and more frequent service between Dublin and Belfast was going to be very beneficial to both cities uh, and all of the areas in between. Uh, and I think there will, with that and with that broader real development, to say from Derry right through to Dublin, Cork, uh, uh, Limerick. Uh, as well uh, as another destination, then there are opportunities to grow indigenous business, establish clusters of key sectors, uh, uh, lever the appetite for collaboration and use the corridor as a driving force for economic development in that region and across the island generally. So I think it should assist in uh, securing high value added jobs while enabling balanced distribution of the benefits and equality of opportunity for all of our citizens. So these are, they, these are ambitious plans. They have been talked about for a long time. I think the involvement of all of the councils, the universities and the uh, endorsement, I think, in, in terms of uh, encouragement along this path from both administrations, north and south, I hope we'll see uh, some advance then in, in these plans and, and the benefits that will flow from them, I think, are undoubtedly uh, right across both the Belfast Dublin corridor, but beyond that as well. I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, um, for your answers so far. Minister, given your department's role in relation um, to the financial services, what action has your department taken to mitigate the damages to the all Ireland economy being done by Brexit and disinvestment of banks like Bank of Ireland and Ulster Bank from both sides? Of the border. Again, this is straying way beyond the economic corridor. I will pass to the minister if he wishes or not to comment. Well, I, I, again, it, it will be a, a very broad answer, I suppose, uh, because it is beyond the detail of what I, I've been uh, asked about. But uh, can I say yes? I very much recognise that. Uh, I think it's an executive collective responsibility alongside the government in Dublin and alongside the British government in terms of the north-south and east-west arrangements to ensure that uh, the, the damage that has been done by Brexit will be mitigated as best as possible. And I think in that regard, the agreement by the, between the British government and the, the European Commission uh, for protocol arrangements, I think, have, have, have done some, gone some way to undo some of the damage that could exist. But undoubtedly, Brexit is going to be a negative impact across this island in particular, and I, I would imagine in the longer term for Britain as well, although that's very much a matter for themselves. Uh, so I, I do think that we need to be protective of that. We need to ensure that the arrangements we have work. Uh, I think we need to... Uh, also ensure that, you know, in, in cases where financial institutions who not that long ago were the benefit of support from uh, public finances, that they are taking decisions which are in the interest of the economic uh, recovery from both Brexit and the pandemic, uh, and that we need to continue to hold them. Of course, we don't have that regulatory authority over financial institutions here, uh, but we need to ensure, as, as we have been doing, that we're engaging with them, that we're encouraging them to see the role that they have to play in terms of economic recovery. When they were in difficult positions, everyone moved to support them, uh, and I think there's a requirement on them to do something similar in this time. I call Andrew Muir. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his responses to date. This is an important report. As we seek to recover our economy, it is vital that we have good north-south and east-west cooperation. I am aware that the Minister has a meeting scheduled potentially this week in a north-south ministerial council meeting with the Economy Minister. Could the Minister perhaps give us an update in relation to the scheduling of that meeting? Is there any potential dairy clashes being co coming up potentially from the other party? Thank you. 
Well, the, the member will know I, I, I'm the accompanying minister in relation to that. I think both myself and the Minister for the Economy and uh, I'm sure our counterparts from the South had to signal to the North-South uh, uh, Ministerial Council uh, administration sector that we were available. I, I, as far as I'm aware, uh, that, that was signalled last week that all ministers are available for the meeting. So I expect it to go ahead on Wednesday afternoon as scheduled. Moving on, I call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Minister and our Deputy Speaker. Sorry. Question four, Minister. Thank you. To date, over £272 million has been issued to almost 13,000 businesses through the Localised Restrictions Support Scheme. Almost every one of the eligible businesses is now fully up to date with the payments they are entitled to for the period of restrictions up to the 14th of April. Land and Property Services will be issuing further payments this week that will cover businesses for their entitlement up to the reopening dates agreed by the Executive last week. Payments are on hold to a small number of applications that are being investigated because a concern has been identified around their eligibility or possibility of double funding with another grant scheme. LPS has issued correspondence to these businesses explaining the situation and providing them with the opportunity to appeal or provide additional information. I call Harry Harvey for supplement. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Does the Minister plan to continue providing localised support schemes payments to businesses that are working at a limited capacity? Yes, uh, I did announce that, uh, and we did have money set aside for whatever, uh, you know, because up until last Thursday we weren't sure what decisions the Executive were going to take in relation to reopening. And obviously, uh, in previous experience, where for instance, retail uh, had some partial reopening, could do click and collect. We continue to pay out retail on, under LRSS because we recognise that they still were very significantly hampered from doing full business. Uh, and similarly with uh, hospitality, and I think in relation to gyms as well, that we have recognised even if there's a partial or outdoor reopening or an ability in the case of gyms to do one-on-one -on -one training, that they are very substantially continue to be restricted uh, in the time ahead. So up to the point of the 24th of May, which is the indicative date, that the executive has given for a full reopening of hospitality we intend to pay out uh, to those uh, because we do recognize that we also recognize that for all businesses beyond even that it, it, there are going to be continue to be mitigations and that is going to restrict business but we are limited in terms of what we can do uh, lrss is based on regulations which is about uh, if a business is open then it's not entitled to payment uh, but the uh, the executives are uh, the minister of the economy's economic recovery plan did receive full financial support from the executive and so we expect that and a combination of the ongoing rates relief to be of some assistance to business in the time ahead i call cara hunter Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer so far. On the topic of localised restriction support payments, with respect to areas like Benone and McGilligan and ports in my constituency, um, they're heavily dependent on tourism to thrive. So can I ask the Minister, have you had any conversations with the Minister for the Economy or the tourism sector on helping these towns build back better after COVID? Thank you. Well, the, the primary responsibility for obviously tourism and, and the economy, as, as you will know, is the, the, the Department of the Economy itself. Uh, we have had discussions with that kind of large hospitality support scheme that the Minister for the Economy has run. I think that has expanded out somewhat, uh, and, and we keep in close contact because at, at, at various times there have been overlaps or certainly close contact between some of the schemes we've been running. Uh, I bear in mind that the Department of Finance doesn't do economic support. That's not our job, but we have, we have taken that up during the course of this pandemic. Uh, but we have kept in close contact with the Department of the Economy and, of course, we have uh, supported in full the bid that the Minister for the Economy made for economic recovery. So I do recognise that uh, a, a lot of, particularly the hospitality sector in our own constituency in the North Coast, uh, is very, very reliant on that uh, tourism industry. And obviously, in terms of international tourism, that's going to be restricted again this year. But I know there was a substantial benefit uh, last year that the Minister for the Economy advised us of, of a, a substantial number of visitors who came north of the border and, and for the, many for the first time to stay. So I would hope it's in all our interest to have a very peaceful time in the run-up to summer and a very peaceful summer and not discourage visitors from coming north because a lot of those businesses are going to be very much reliant on business on the island of Ireland this year. And I think we do need to do all collectively in our, our power to make sure that we have somewhere which people want to come to uh, over the summer months and that those businesses can get the best benefit they possibly can from that. I call Kelly Armstrong. Very much, Minister, and I'd like to pass on my thanks to um, you and your department for the help that you have given my office in helping those businesses. But could I ask, in mid-March, um, there was an announcement about top-up payments were um, 
provided, but they're yet to be paid. When will businesses receive them? And additionally, where can businesses go to get an update on when their payment will be made? Uh, there, there are, uh, there have been a number of those payments have been the payments have been made uh, basically every day uh, since there, there were uh, some payments were held back because there were queries as to whether people had been paid wrongly or uh, perhaps overpaid or perhaps had, had benefits of two different sets of grant support uh, and, and there are a number of cases where the LRS uh, the LPS uh, informed people that they. We're investigating that and give them an opportunity to provide additional information. Uh, and in some cases, there will have to be a recovery of money paid out, uh, although that can be offset if another grant is available to someone that they can offset the payment and basically deduct it from whatever grant they may well get. So there, there is an ongoing work. It's, it's a very marginal amount because I think in the overall scheme, it's, it's about 1.6% of, of uh, payments that, that were made out uh, possibly are an error uh, and there's some effort to recover that. So that has slowed down some of the top-up payments because I think rather than continue on, whenever there was a question or arose, then LPS were obliged to go off and investigate whether the payments would be made properly. Uh, and I know for a lot of businesses that, that raises concern, but we do also have a responsibility to the public purse to make sure that payments are being made correctly and where those have been made an error, that there's an attempt to recover them. Moving on, I call Christopher Stelford. Question number five, sir. Each civil service department is responsible for managing its resources, both financial and staff. When a department identifies a vacancy that it needs filled, the request is referred to next HR within my department to initiate the process to fill the post. At the end of March, my department had been asked to fill over 3,000 posts across the civil service, which had been confirmed as affordable by the relevant departments. Approximately nine. 1,900 of these posts are general service posts. Around 1,000 are administrative officers, staff officer, deputy principal grade, for which there are live recruitment competitions with either available appointees or selection activity in progress. A further 1,250 posts are a wide range of non-general service specialist posts, and Nick's HR continues to plan and deliver recruitment competitions to fill these vacancies, working with departments to seek to prioritise, agree and plan to fill the most urgent posts. Since November, Nick's HR has filled over 1,500 vacancies. I call Christopher Stelford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Sir, at various committees, it's been outlined uh, to us how difficult it has been for departments to deliver on their priorities because of shortages in the civil service. Can I ask the Minister what steps his department and indeed the government will undertake to advertise civil service careers to young people coming through? As an, as a, an attractive prospect uh, for them to build their lives upon? Well, that, uh, it, it's part of the ongoing work, uh, and I mean, it's up to departments to identify their individual workforce. Uh, but I think we have a broader responsibility in terms of that wider piece of reform of civil service to make sure it is accessible. Uh, and that we are trying to attract a younger cohort of people and, and we've been having conversations about the idea of apprenticeship schemes uh, in the civil service and I know it's something that the Department of the Economy are, are very keen on and we want to ha encourage, uh, if you like, a, a uniform approach across all departments so it's not ad hoc uh, approach to this. So there is a recognition uh, that this recruitment exercise that is required uh, can be something which can actually uh, infuse more diversity and uh, more, uh, I suppose, altering of the age profile uh, into the civil service as a whole. And there is a recognition, as I said in answer to a previous question, that there is a substantial area of work to be done there. And this exercise, along with a number of other exercises in terms of the civil service estate, of, of uh, a new approach to working, blended working arrangements, I think all can contribute to that idea of recruiting more people, but recruiting more diversity in terms of age and, and other profiles, and disability, ethnic uh, minorities, uh, uh, and that type of diversity that we need within the civil service to reflect society as a whole. I call Steve Aiken. Thank the Minister for his uh, answers so far. Uh, just very quickly, Minister. Uh, has there been any detailed assessment made of the voluntary exit scheme and the impact that it's had on civil service vacancies? And are we be able to look very closely at the impact that that's had on efficiency and whether there's a read across currently to the, the vacancy problem within the civil service? Well, I, I'm not aware of if that has been done. I, I, would, I would imagine, given that the, the scheme was put in place, that uh, not only assessment of how it, it, it ran its course, but also the impact of it uh, would be available. But I'd be very happy to talk to officials and provide them with some material if it exists. 
And that is the end of our period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes for topical questions. Question number six has been withdrawn, and I call William Humphrey. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Can the Minister update the House uh, on the final bud budget allocation for the PSNI and how many officers that will actually mean on the ground, new officers on the ground for the police, given that some 700 extra officers were promised in NDNA? Well, I, uh, 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 the figure might elude me just at the moment, but I can provide it for him. I know we did have a, a lengthy discussion between the initial, initial budget uh, outline of, of what was available for next year and the final budget paper, which will be brought uh, very shortly uh, to, to the House for, uh, for discussion and questions uh, to improve the position in relation to the number of police officers that can be recruited. So there has been an improvement. That, that does place, uh, if you like, uh, as he will know, once you recruit somebody and put them in post, then that becomes a recurrent cost year on year. So in some sense, while we can find money next year, that commits us then to a year on year uh, recurrent expenditure in that regard, and, th and that's what the executive has agreed to in its final budget position. So the actual figures uh, that are involved, I will, I will get to the member, uh, but it is an improvement on the previous position in the draft budget position that was outlined. To the House that we are not able to get confirmation that the 700 extra officers will be in place. Can the Minister inform the House how and when he is going to allocate funding to the victims' pensions uh, and how will he restore confidence in his department given the recent damning court case? Well, I'm not, I'm not certain that there's a question of a lack of confidence in my department. I'm actually representing the executive's view in relation to uh, the funding arrangements for that. As he will know, uh, the British Government's own statement of funding policy states very clearly that where uh, a, a government department has developed a policy and has legislated for that, then they have a responsibility for paying any costs that accrue from that. Uh, and in relation to the, the, the victim scheme that the British government brought forward, it is vastly different from the scheme which was agreed by the parties at Stormont House. Uh, and they have added very substantially to the scope of it and also uh, subsequently to the cost of the scheme. Uh, and so while we have committed uh, and we have given undertakings to the court, myself, the First and Deputy First Minister and the Minister for Justice, to ensure that victims' payments are made, and that's where we wanted to be. We have always wanted a scheme to be running and the certainty uh, for victims. Uh, we will still continue to have that discussion uh, with the British Government in relation to the responsibility for the fund, but the Executive will ensure that payments are made to victims. And I call Nicola Brogan. I'll ask Ancorla. Minister, the new grant schemes that you've announced are very welcome um, now that we're moving towards economic recovery. Can you provide um, an update on when businesses are likely to receive these grants? Yes, there, there are a number of schemes. The, uh, the one which I, I, I probably in my enthusiasm this morning announced was opening today is actually opening tomorrow for applications uh, in relation to businesses which had a, an NAV of above. Uh, 50,000 and didn't, weren't able to avail of business grants last year, uh, can now apply from tomorrow. Uh, there are schemes to support manufacturing uh, and, and uh, there are top up schemes for businesses which weren't able to, of, of five and ten thousand pounds, which weren't able to avail of LRSS or other supports uh, over the last uh, number of months. Uh, and so I, I think this, these schemes were developed firstly because we know there's an ongoing need for business support. Uh, but also it was to ensure that the money, the COVID money that we had was, was allocated uh, and wouldn't be returned to Treasury. Uh, and so they, they will be, uh, I think, in the coming weeks, uh, will be further detail in relation to those, and we would hope to see them paying out as soon as possible, uh, because we do recognise that while there is an optimism uh, that things are opening up again and that people will be able to get back to business, the effects of the pandemic will be with us for a long time, uh, and the ability of people to get back to the normal way of trading uh, will be some time off because we, uh, restrictions will continue to apply in some shape or form uh, for the foreseeable future. So these uh, schemes would be very important uh, to try and support those who hadn't the ability to get LRSS and various other support schemes. I call Nicola Brogan for supplementary. Gary Mergut, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive answer there. Um, it is also welcome news that most businesses now have a date for reopening. Um, can you confirm that LRSS payments will continue to be made to those eligible businesses um, until they can legally resume trading? Yes, uh, as, as we have said, that the, uh, we do recognise, as we did when uh, Click and Collect opened up for retail, 
uh, that, that although people could now trade in some fashion, uh, they still were a, a long way off and si significantly impacted by uh, the restrictions that continue to exist. Similarly, with hospitality uh, and gyms, uh, that even though uh, hospitality can operate on an outdoor basis uh, in a country like this, where you can never be certain of the weather, uh, that can be uh, still a very restrictive uh, area in which to operate. And, and gyms, while they could open up for one-on-one -on -one training, uh, as as those of us who frequent them uh, would know, uh, they're mainly uh, a lot of the finances they will uh, accrue are from uh, classes, uh, the ability to take uh, groups of people in to do training. So they continue to be significantly restricted. Uh, but they, so we have undertaken, uh, the executive have given an indicative date for full reopening, both in terms of hospitality uh, and uh, gyms as the 24th. And we sincerely hope that we are able to meet that date. Uh, and that's the, the clear intention of the executive. So we have given an undertaking up to that point to continue to support them through LRSS. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Minister, could I ask, um, we know that we have environmental targets and we want to get to net zero emissions by 2050, although I think we can do this a bit earlier. But the only reason we can, I think we can do this earlier, is if we change our procurement criteria to ensure that not only do our public services purchase environmentally friendly and environmentally improving um, items, but also that anyone else who is funded by government follows that procurement path. Could you provide an update on the work that's being done within your department to ensure that procurement is going to be changed to in keep environmental practices to the fore? Well, as the member will know, we've recently reconstituted the procurement board uh, and we've added a, 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 a lot more people with who have direct experience both from the uh, procuring themselves within in the various departments, but also those on the kind of business end of that uh, to try and improve the, the overall procurement function. We are looking uh, very closely and uh, uh, intend to bring policy in relation to social value. And social value can, can look at a whole range of measures, including environmental issues as well, uh, and to ensure that we uh, achieve the best outcome. And outcomes will actually meet the executive's targets in other areas, such as you say, in relation to uh, carbon reduction. Uh, so, yes, we're, we're very happy to take all of those issues on board. Um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm very open to the idea of looking to see how, not only in our terms of our own procurement, but uh, we have been looking very closely at the idea of supply chains and ethical uh, policies within supply chains. And ethical can mean anything from you know, using slave labour, basically, but also using uh, production methods which are challenging uh, are damaging uh, to the environment and contributing to climate change crisis. Uh, so I think these are all areas that the department wants to look at. And even though in global terms we're a very small procurer, uh, I do think we have a responsibility to lead by example in these matters. So I'm, I'm very keen that policies in terms of social value, ethical procurement are all things that we bring very much to the fore in the time ahead. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, Minister. Minister, in the run-up to Earth Day, I'm very keen to ensure that where we're talking about reducing carbon emissions, that we actually are seen to be doing this as government. We know that we have a lot of um, car parking spaces in civil service buildings and public buildings across Belfast, but my particular ask to you is, the building regulations that are coming up, is there anything being considered within that that people will, or whoever's coming forward with new buildings will have to consider public transport access to those buildings? And can that be a cross-government, cross-departmental commitment that all new buildings then coming from your building regulations will have a reduction in car parking spaces so that we can build on our public transport services? Well, we have already put a proposition to departments. We have a responsibility for civil service estate, uh, and we have put a proposition for reducing car parking spaces uh, in Belfast city centre. Uh, and there are uh, very decent, and some would say excellent, uh, public transport uh, facilities are, uh, available to get people into the city centre. Uh, and so we have done that, uh, and we are doing that. Uh, not surprisingly, people who have been used to driving their cars in and parking in the city centre have uh, sometimes issue with that. Uh, but nonetheless, I think if we want to achieve the type of outcomes that the member is referring to, then we do have to look at our own house uh, in the first instance. So uh, I, I think the logical follow-through of that is that when we are planning any new buildings, that we have to ensure the, that public transport is a feature in terms, in terms of that. And uh, I think that follows through on something we've already been developing. And I call Trevor Lund. Thank you much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm afraid my question is remarkably similar to what Mr. Humphrey asked you a few moments ago. 
uh, but it's about the trouble to related victims' pension scheme and the funding of it. Now, at the moment, we have three departments, including your own, plus the British government, all telling us that they can't afford to fund this scheme. And we have an assurance from the executive office and yourselves that it will be funded and payments will be made on time for a scheme that's going to open for applications next month. Can you tell us how you assess that it will be funded? Well, firstly, uh, the, the British government haven't said they can't afford it. They've just simply said they're not going to do it. Uh, so I think it's well within their, their uh, affordability to be able to do that, and, and it's right according to their own statement of funding policy that they do that. It's part of their own rules, uh, rules that they have established with their own government departments, which they are disregarding in this instance. So it's not a question of affordability for them. It is a question of affordability for us, but we have given an undertaking that this will be done. Uh, however, we have to find the resource to do it. Uh, we've given an undertaking that will be done. We've already provided uh, a, a expenditure uh, over the last, I think, two financial years uh, to, for administration. So we've already contributed to getting the scheme up and running. Uh, and we have given an undertaking to the court that payments will be made and will be made on time. And we will hold to that commitment. But we will continue to engage with the British government in relation to its responsibilities in this matter. Uh, and its responsibilities under its own policy uh, are to meet the costs of this scheme. I call Trevor Lund. Yes, I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, he, he would be familiar with the Government Actuary Department's estimate for the cost of this scheme, which at the top level is £1.2 billion. So I appreciate that's over a long number of years. Uh, and I wish you luck with your, uh, <laughs> your activity with the British Government at the moment. But the, is it possible that you may have to consider, as, as Finance Minister, revenue raising possibilities? that hitherto have been turned down. I'm thinking of water charges and the rates cap on domestic property, and there's probably one or two others I can't think about. Is it possible you may have to delve into those sort of issues? Well, I mean, it, firstly, we've always wanted this scheme to be up and running again, be fully funded, uh, and we have never wanted a situation where victims end up having to go to court to resolve these issues. Uh, and, and create further distress and uncertainty in relation to, to payments. That's never the place where we wanted to be, and we had to try to have some logical discussions with the Secretary of State and others over a period of time, which were very fruitless and difficult to actually arrange uh, and continue to be difficult to arrange. Uh, so we ended up in a situation which was not of our desire and not of our making, but we have given undertakings in order to try and give that certainty uh, to victims. Undoubtedly, if, if, if we can't resolve this with the government and the executive have to end up uh, meeting the cost itself, and as you say, it's anything between 600 million and, and 1.2 billion, according to the government actuary department, then it will be a question for the executive how to find resources to do that. Uh, one such uh, way is to top slice departments and, and pro rata take the funding year on year that is required for the scheme off departments' budgets if we don't have any additional support to do this from Treasury. Uh, and other ways are to look at fundraising, but I have to say, uh, certainly over the first four to five years, the costs associated with this would be so significant. I doubt if there's any fundraising capability within the executive to match that. I call Mervyn Story. Mr. Speaker, the Minister will join with me and, as a member of the Policing Board, condemning the uh, murderous attempt uh, on a police officer uh, in uh, Lumavadi over the last few hours. And uh, we send our thoughts to the uh, constable, the part-time constable who was involved. I uh, also welcome the fact that the minister will open the business uh, fund tomorrow. That's uh, well welcomed and place on record our appreciation to LPS for the outstanding work that they have done. I return to the, the issue of procurement. And the, the minister has given us changes to the board, social requirements, and, and even thrown in climate change. Well, he also put in there efficiency. Because this week already I've had two cases brought to me and um, the problem has been procurement. Will he address that issue within procurement rules? Uh, well, f firstly, I concur with his remarks in relation to the incident in Mavadi, uh, and, and I appreciate his remarks in relation to LPS and the work that they have done. And uh, I think LPS, uh, like the department, are looking forward to getting back to what they do, is collecting rates. Uh, but there's, there's still uh, some more work to be done in terms of getting support out there. Uh, and, and I think they've performed that function very effectively. Uh, in relation to procurement, of course, we want to make things as efficient as possible. So we're, it's, we're not just simply looking at social value and, uh, and how procurement can be of benefit more broadly. Procurement has to be done efficiently. We have to make sure that there's value for money. Uh, we have to make sure that, that uh, 
the uh, relationship between how government award contracts and those uh, who, who uh, would be people who, who, who would be in that uh, I suppose sphere to try and provide services to government that that's as efficient as it can be and that's why we, we took off if you like the permanent secretaries from the procurement board and we put in people from within the various uh, practitioner fields uh, uh, from construction from uh, social economy from a range of areas that have a direct experience of dealing with government to try and make sure that people are talking the same language and we get an efficient outcome from procurement policy and that is the end of our period of time for questions to the minister of finance and ask members to take ease for a few moments as we change places.